thanks very much uh, to you all for coming uh, to this, um, the IISS, the second uh, uh, public meeting of the year, this one on eliminating um, chemical weapons. I'm Mark Fitzpatrick, the director of the Nonproliferation and Disarmament Program. We normally um, spend a lot of our time on um, nuclear weapons related subjects, but uh, we've been trying to give some attention to chemical weapons. Last year, of course, was a, a year of great progress in, um, in the path to eliminating chemical weapons, and I think this year we'll, um, there will be another push uh, in this direction, and we'll hear more about that. Um, we'll hear more about that, I think, primarily from Peter Sozak, who joins us from The Hague this morning, where he is the head of government relations and political affairs for the Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons. Uh, he's an international civil servant uh, now. He previously was an Australian uh, civil servant. Uh, he worked uh, in various diplomatic capacities, including a senior advisor on international security to the Australian Minister for Foreign Affairs. I met him uh, when he was in Washington um, working on uh, nonproliferation and other matters, uh, and when he served as Director of Counterproliferation at the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Ambassador uh, Shimon Stein will uh, speak secondly. Um, Shimon is an independent analyst um, who is uh, a senior research fellow at the Tel Aviv-based Institute for National Security Studies, uh, where he contributes uh, articles on arms control uh, and uh, other foreign policy matters. He's uh, been um, uh, uh, he is a veteran uh, uh, Israeli diplomat who um, served. Um, including as ambassador to Germany. He's written on chem chemical weapons uh, issue, and um, uh, I look forward to his view. And finally, um, Nomi Baryakov will join um, the panel as uh, she was advertised as a discussant. Um, she comes from northern um, London, and uh, <laughs> she's an uh, associate fellow at Chatham House uh, and a member of the Board of Acronym uh, Institute for Disarmament Diplomacy. She's a, a well-known international mediator and arbitrator and a convener of track to negotiations in the Middle East. She's also been following the uh, debate uh, in Israel, and there now is a debate <coughs> on the chemical weapons uh, issue in Israel, and we look uh, forward to hearing that. Um, we had um, invited somebody from Egypt also to join us, Egypt being the other um, nation in the Middle East that has not uh, uh, acceded to the Chemical Weapons Convention. Um, if there's anybody uh, in the audience uh, from Egypt or associated with Egypt or any, in any way or would like to uh, contribute during the discussion, uh, we would welcome uh, that. Peter, could I uh, ask you to lead us off? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Mark. Uh, in fact, uh, yes, I have a long-standing association with arms control issues. In fact, I came into this world um, into multilateral arms control diplomacy, and it was not a satisfactory experience. Um, I was to negotiate the verification protocol for the Biological Weapons <laughs> Convention. Within three weeks of starting that job, um, that whole process was canned, so I had a sour taste in my mouth. After that, I worked on export controls, perhaps coalition and diplomacy on arms control issues, which was more satisfactory. I saw it from a bilateral angle when I was on posting in Washington in terms of the deal between the US and Russia and the new start. <laughs> Um, and I've come back to multilateral diplomacy and arms control with this job now in the OPCW, and I'm pleased to say it's been an entirely satisfactory experience, given the success we've had. So what I propose to do in the, in the 10 minutes or so I have is to sketch out three main areas of interest. First of all, how we measure our success in eliminating chemical weapons, the topic of our discussion, including in relation to the Syria mission more recently. Secondly, to give you a, a very brief sense of the challenges ahead. And thirdly, to... Uh, provide some rationale for extending our reach. As good as it is, it could be better. So my organization, the OPCW, is mandated, as you know, to implement the Chemical Weapons Convention. Now, I think it'd be no overstatement to say that the CWC is probably the most successful arms control treaty in history. Since it entered into force in 1997, we've presided over what can only be described as prodigious uh, achievements. So the facts, of course, speak for themselves. Here are a few of them. Over the last two decades, almost two decades, our membership has grown to 190 member states, six short of complete universality. And so far, we've eliminated, verified the elimination of about almost 87% of all declared chemical weapons around the world across 98% of the world's surface, 98% of the world's populations, which is quite an achievement. That's about 63,000 metric tons of 71,000 declared uh, metric tons of chemical agent. So what this all means is that 
the goal of a chemical of, of achieving complete destruction of chemical mm -hmm. known chemical weapons mm -hmm. is not an as aspirational goal. It's actually a, a looming reality. And we like to think at the OPCW that this sort of tangible evidence of uh, disarmament uh, is what helped us win the Nobel Peace Prize in 2013, as much of a surprise as it was for us uh, in the organization. I mean that quite sincerely. Um, so it shows that the CWC actually does work. Now, the Syria mission, of course, has provided even more compelling evidence in this regard, and it's left no doubt as to the global consensus against chemical weapons, which in fact allowed us to negotiate the Chemical Weapons Convention in the first place. Uh, here again, the facts speak for themselves. Less than one year after the OPCW's Executive Council took a decision on the 27th of September, uh, 2013 to, uh, on, on a destruction program for chem serious chemical weapons, all declared chemical weapons were removed from Syrian territory and they have been almost entirely destroyed. The figure is some 98% now. Um, this includes all Category 1 chemicals. In other words, the already primed sulfur mustard uh, weapons as well as main precursor chemicals for nerve agent. What's important about the Syria mission is the fact that it did not need a specially mandated uh, um, arrangement, ad hoc arrangement, to do this job. It basically fell to the tried and tested regime that the CWC represents. This regime ensured that you know, what, was a, you know, what was effectively a routine job for us could still be done in very non-routine circumstances of a civil conflict and uh, very compressed time frames. So basically, as soon as Syria joined the CWC, it was subject to a very familiar process, a routine process, provision of declaration, uh, obtaining agreement to a destruction program for its chemical weapons, given that it declared itself to be a possessor state, and of course, verification of destruction by OPCW inspectors. And here I'll just refer you to those unique provisions of the CWC that make it a tr tried and tested regime. The CWC, of course, is a non-discriminatory regime. Unlike the NPT, there are no haves and have-nots. Every country that is a member of the CWC is, a, is a held to the same rights and obligations. Secondly, unlike the Biological Weapons Convention, which also bans an entire class of WMD, it actually has a verification regime, a verification regime that works, that was negotiated with um, industry and states uh, uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. So this has underpinned our success in Syria, of course, I mean, this model that we have. But there are also factors that were quite exceptional, given the circumstances, as I mentioned, of uh, the civil war and uh, compressed time frames for destruction. For example, possessive states are obliged to destroy chemical weapons at their own cost on their own territory. States' parties saw the opportunity that Syria provided by um, agreeing to remove the weapons and destroy them outside Syrian territory. So we had enough of the spirit of the convention to overcome legal strictures, perhaps, in terms of the political mechanics of the membership of the um, CWC. Secondly, we had a very well-coordinated coordinated international effort, which involved interlocking in-kind and financial support, which was never undersubscribed through the course of this mission. Thirdly, we had an important partnership with the UN. Now, the OPCW is an independent international organization. We had an existing partnership agreement with the UN of a broader nature, for instance, that permitted us to support the UN investigation on alleged uses of chemical weapons in Syria before Syria became a state party, the, the well-known confirmed attacks, sarin attacks in Ghouta and the outskirts of uh, Damascus. But we had a special arrangement in order to deploy to a war situation. We've never done that before. The UN provided crucial field support and security support, for example, negotiating with opposition forces to get access to some sites. Fourthly, we had extraordinary technical innovation. When we couldn't get somebody to uh, come up with a land-based option for destroying these chemical weapons, um, we came up with a seaborne uh, destruction option uh, um, on the US, Cape, US vessel, the Cape Ray, which worked very, very well. Um, one two sites were hard to access physically and we were able to come up with um, uh, uh, um, an option, uh, uh, an, uh, a way of uh, inspecting the site through uh, GPS mounted cameras to do remote access basically. So these innovations were, were very useful for the success of the mission. 
Um, and lastly, I would mention private-public partnerships. I don't want to make too much about this, but we've seen how private-public partnerships work with other non-traditional multilateral challenges, and from child immunization to poverty alleviation. What we did with a large part of the toxic chemicals declared by, chemical, uh, by Syria was to put to commercial tender their destruction. And at the end of this process, two companies were selected, Veolia in the United States and um, uh, Ecochem in uh, Finland to destroy some of these chemical weapons, these toxic chemicals. So this was uh, a good indication of how commercial engagement can be used in non-proliferation, hopefully not the last time. The OPCW has also um, made sure we're pushing our mandate in relation to follow-up work. There is ongoing work in terms of ensuring that Syria's initial declaration is complete. We have had more than half a dozen meetings with Syrian officials to this end to make sure they know what their obligations are, that they are crossing T's and dotting I's. We also have ongoing work in relation to the destruction of former production facilities. These are 12 sites. They're not production facilities so much as uh, facilities that hosted um, production uh, um, equipment. Um, we already started work on the first of uh, these facilities to destroy it. And we're also following up on um, persistent allegations of chlorine gas use in Syria through the fact-finding mission that the Director General of the OPCW established in April last year. So while Syria has obviously rightly preoccupied our efforts over the last year and a half or so, we have also not lost sight of strategic uh, um, challenges coming up. Um, broadly, I'd categorize them in, in, in two ways. You know, there's one set of challenges within the OPCW, the other is without. The first relates to a process of transition, as our main focus gradually moves from disarmament to non-proliferation. Um, as I mentioned, 87% of declared chemical weapons um, has, is complete. Um, what we do next is something we need to, to focus on. Obviously, we do non-proliferation, disarmament, cooperation and peaceful uses altogether, but the focus of our efforts now need to be directed at uh, preventing the re-emergence of chemical weapons. And this obviously is a publicly less visible and a qualitatively much harder task. The second set of challenges relates to changes in the strategic environment. Um, these are globalization of chemical industry and what this means for how we do our industry inspections. This particularly applies to the shift of uh, the center of economic um, power eastwards towards Asia. This is going to have a big impact on how we do our inspections down the track. Um, also, advances in science and technology could well challenge how we implement the convention down the track. Uh, new advances in um, uh, could help mask production uh, uh, technologies uh, um, and opportunities. Um, uh, a third uh, set of challenges or changes in the strategic environment relates um, obviously to the ambitions and actions of non-state actors. We've seen a lot of allegations of use of chlorine in, in Syria as well as in Iraq lately. And finally, um, there's increasing potential for intangible technology transfers through advances in communications, which we need to be <laughs> alert to. So how these two sets of challenges intertwine is very much on our minds in the OPCW and among states parties as we look at um, charting our strategic direction. Um, there's also a discussion going on within the OPCW about what sort of organization we need to be in response to a gradual readjustment of our priorities to uh, focus more on the prevention of re-emergence of chemical weapons. <coughs> Obviously, in the course of our discussion, I'd be happy to elaborate on these challenges, but before um, uh, I you know, round up, I'd like to sort of just mention some unfinished business uh, in relation to Syria, and that is the, the new focus on the need to universalize the CWC. Now, I mentioned we have a membership of 190 member states. Um, there are only six countries outside the convention at this stage, uh, Angola, Egypt, Israel, Myanmar, North Korea, and South Sudan. And we had an interesting discussion um, under Chatham House Rules recently um, in this venue um, on, this, uh, on this subject uh, with a focus on the Middle East. Um, just to update you, I mean, Myanmar is definitely on track to ratifying. They are actually a signatory to the CWC. Their Deputy Foreign Minister addressed our Conference of States Parties in December and last month, um, noting that they had already ratified the, or deposited the instrument of ratification for the Biological Weapons Convention that Parliament in the current session will consider ratification of the CWC. Certainly all government ministries and the cabinet of ministers are agreed that this is a good thing to do. So we're hoping that they'll be our newest member very shortly. Angola, um, as you probably are aware, has just um, assumed its 
temporary seat on the Security Council and is focusing a lot of attention on making sure um, it's uh, on board with the few treaties where it's not a state party, including the CWC. <coughs> Certainly Angola has mentioned publicly that um, it will accede to the CWC, so we're hopeful that it will happen very soon. South Sudan, in the context we had with um, the government there, um, before the current conflict arose, had no objections to ratifying the CWC, but obviously has a large agenda um, on the governance side ahead of it. We're hoping we can bundle the CWC with other important treaties for um, uh, the government there to uh, uh, accede to uh, as soon as possible. This would obviously leave Egypt, Israel, and North Korea um, uh, still outside the treaty. Um, I'm an international civil servant, so all I can say here is that these countries will, of course, make their own assessments about what's in their national security interests. What I would draw your attention to is several factors that you know, should be perhaps taken into account as these uh, decisions are made. First of all, the Syrian mission has removed effectively the last strategic threat from chemical weapons in the region. Um, in fact, uh, and this is perhaps attested to um, in Israel recently by the decision not to produce any more gas masks. You might recall in January last year, um, uh, the Prime Minister's office put out a statement that in light of a new security assessment in relation to the CW threat, gas masks would, distribution of gas masks would be suspended. A decision was taken last month, I understand from my reading of the Israeli media, uh, not to produce any more gas masks. Um, this is, of course, the fact that this threat has been removed from Syria also amply proves the resilience uh, of the Chemical Weapons Convention uh, in this regard. Um, I'd also mention that um, given the well-established international norm that the CWC represents, uh, chemical weapons should not perhaps be the subject of ambiguity or used as a bargaining chip in relation to broader uh, regional security questions. The CWC, in our view, stands on its own merits. Um, CW, chemical weapons are, have been proven to be taboo. Certainly the reaction to use of chemical weapons in Syria showed that amply in relation to the international reaction. Um, but so <coughs> given this, chemical weapons are clearly not a strategic option for any country. So there's nothing that's really being given up, so to speak, that is of any strategic interest to anybody. Finally, I would just note that the CWC's verification provisions should reinforce confidence. They're comprehensive, but without compromising a country's commercial secrets or its national security interests. Um, and uh, all countries, including Israel and Egypt, did participate in the negotiations. Israel, in fact, is a signatory to the CWC, um, and uh, we have to assume on this basis that um, it is a signatory because it could live with the verification provisions negotiated under the CWC. Um, we had a discussion, in fact, uh, well, we can talk about that later, perhaps. Look, I might leave it there, not to take too much time here. What I would say here is that, you know, in the tw over the 20 years since the CWC was concluded, you know, it remains the only legally binding international treaty that not only bans an entire class of weapons of mass destruction, but it does so without discrimination and subject <coughs> to international verification. So in this uh, in this context, uh, um, certainly our view is that it provides a very important baseline for future disarmament efforts. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, if the gentleman in the back would like to uh, take any of the seats in front, I apologize that we are almost overflowing. We, um, we moved to this room from the upstairs because we didn't think we would have uh, enough to, uh, to pack the room upstairs, but uh, you've all followed through with your, your um, intentions to attend and uh, appreciate that. Shimon, um, tell us a little bit about uh, Israel's position and maybe some of your own thoughts, if you don't mind. I don't. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark, and thanks for uh, inviting me. So, uh, why doesn't Israel ratify the uh, convention? I mean, we have had the persuasive arguments for Peter, and nevertheless, the, uh, the question uh, uh, stands uh, in, the, uh, in the room. Uh, a long and detailed uh, answer to the question can be found in a document, as a matter of fact, in a speech that was delivered by an Israeli official in uh, September of 1997 before the uh, conference of uh, disarmament uh, regarding Israel's approach to uh, regional security, arms control, and uh, disarmament. But since we are uh, short in time, let me first give you a short official answer 
to the question and then as a retired official who is at liberty to speak freely offer you my uh, thoughts uh, on the subject of whether Israel uh, should reconsider its position on the uh, CWC ratification. Well, the uh, short answer was provided by the uh, Foreign Ministry uh, spokesman <coughs> who, uh, against the background of the upcoming uh, US-Russian uh, uh, proposal uh, to dismantle uh, uh, Syrian chemical uh, uh, weapons and uh, in order to uh, preempt calls for Israel to uh, respond uh, said uh, in October uh, 2013 that uh, I quote in Israel will not ratify the convention as long as other states in the region that does not recognize Israel's existence and threaten to liquidate it possess chemical weapons furthermore he said that terror organizations who are operating under the control of those states may also use chemical uh, weapons. The threat of use of chemical weapons against the civilian population of Israel is not theoretical or distant and therefore Israel cannot ignore the threat when Israel decides whether to ratify or not to ratify the convention. So far uh, for the uh, rather quick and expected response uh, to the development which uh, I will not only uh, uh, found important and uh, uh, was uh, because I found that, that uh, step by Syrian uh, to bear some potential implications. Anyway, uh, the spokesman's response however has to uh, be seen in the context of uh, the overall Israeli approach uh, to the question that has to do with the uh, threat perception, with the geostrategic setting, with Israel's structural vulnerabilities and henceforth with Israel's national security doctrine and capabilities that is designed to offset vulnerabilities and disparities even if, I had to say, their nature has recently uh, changed. Out of the above mentioned stems <coughs> Israel's regional approach as opposed to the global approach to security arms control and disarmament which uh, in our mind cannot provide a response to the unique security problems of the Middle East in general and to those of Israel in particular. The primacy of regional arrangement as an answer to a security and stability problems uh, in the entire region, notwithstanding, where appropriate, Israel endorses global agreement which could complement those to be established at the regional level. And indeed, the CWC is one case in point where Israel saw the value of signing and playing an active role in the, inter, in the international efforts uh, to craft the convention into a workable mechanism. In responding to the question, why not ratify the convention on the Israeli, the Israeli foreign minister responded at the uh, signing ceremony in 1993 by saying the chemical weapon, weapons convention must refer to our region and that the region at large must adhere to its principles. End of quote. Israel made it clear that it would seek to ratify the convention subject to regional concerns as well as to its uh, constitutional uh, constraints and legislative timetable. In other words, federal changes in the security climate will of course favorably affect Israel's attitude on the ratification issue. So far to the official, official rationale, so to speak, which, are, which makes a lot of sense given the fact that I uh, was involved in crafting it. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, against the backdrop of the uh, Syrian decision to dismantle its CW uh, arsenal and uh, ratify the convention, the question that I uh, posed, as opposed to the rather quick and uh, preemptive official reaction, is whether the uh, 
considerations that led to our decision not to ratify are still relevant or due to the uh, Syrian move the situation has changed? Will a ratification have an impact on our overall deterrence posture? Or is it preferable to preserve the status quo? The ratification might, as some say, lead to a, a slippery slope, and therefore it doesn't that justify taking risks. All valid uh, questions uh, for which uh, I don't uh, <coughs> have uh, uh, full answers. Having said that, there are basically uh, three responses uh, to the new situation, the way I see it, and as well as uh, also some of my colleagues. The first one is not to do anything, namely uh, preserving the status quo. That is, uh, that is the official line as uh, uh, <coughs> I've uh, outlined. The second one is to take a unilateral step, irrespective of Egypt's reaction. Those uh, who advocate that option argue that with Syria move, a threat is gone and Egypt doesn't preserve, present a CWD threat to Israel. And finally, Israel with its historical <coughs> past and the investment in the civil defense does not need to fear uh, threats and can, uh, by ratifying, contribute to the process that uh, Peter was referring to of uh, universalizing uh, the convention. The third approach, the one that I have been advocating and also wrote about it, doesn't disagree with the second approach, but suggests a more cautious uh, and nuanced uh, to use the move <coughs> to resuscitate the regional, uh, the regional, uh, uh, the regional uh, discussion by uh, resuming a dialogue and so following the completion and verification of the dismantlement project the regional parties should enter a regional discussion and later negotiation that will deal with setting up a regional CWC that means setting up a regional organization with verification mechanisms and where appropriate and with the consent of the regional parties, the OPCW should also be uh, involved. Such a discussion should not only be confined to CWC matters, it should at the same time come up with a comprehensive agenda where all security issues should be placed on the table. <coughs> now, is it realistic given the state, the state in, the, in which the region finds itself nowadays to discuss such alternatives, <coughs> it might end up as an idea whose time has not uh, arrived yet. That, by the way, goes also for the much broader idea <coughs> of discussing a WMD zone <coughs> in the Middle East, an idea which has been on the agenda for time immemorial, and uh, privately speaking, uh, whose time has <coughs> not yet come and probably not come for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shimon, for outlining <coughs> both the uh, government's position and, and your own. Um, there's still two seats in the front, Ben, if you want to join. Nomi, give us uh, another uh, perspective on this issue, if you don't mind. Okay. Well, I, um, thank you. First of all, thank you very much, Mark, um, for inviting me and for continuing to make the um, CWC as a sort of possession of chemical weapons um, an issue. <coughs> I think is, um, is very important and doesn't necessarily get enough attention. I don't want to repeat anything, Mark, uh, sorry, that Peter or um, Shimon said, although I just, um, I would like to, um, uh, Shimon to uh, clarify a little bit the regional CWC issue in order to be able to um, comment upon it. But can you just clarify what you mean by a regional CWC in a little bit more detail? <coughs> yes, what I mean uh, by that is uh, based on our fundamental approach that uh, uh, the region has primacy over uh, global, we uh, have been advocating uh, in the context of uh, setting up uh, uh, 
WMD uh, free zone the notion that everything has to uh, come from the region and therefore the region has to establish regional organizations uh, we know uh, from the nuclear case that there are some regional organizations that, that deal with regional issues so the idea is to uh, set up a regional CWC agency which will be tasked with the verification implementation where the inspectors will come from the region primarily and as I said where possible and necessary we will also act in close cooperation with the OPCW so the idea is to base the CWC implementation uh, on regional organizations uh, organization that will be uh, tasked with that force. That will also add a lot to uh, the uh, deep-seated mistrust at this stage and also to confidence where the parties in the region themselves will be tasked with that uh, uh, major uh, issue. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shimon, for clarifying. I just wish to clarify a couple of issues. The, OPC, um, the OPCW verification regime um, is, I think, one of the most sophisticated regimes of um, um, you know, international treaties in general. And we recently, um, the, uh, Chatham House recently held a um, workshop at, the, at OPCW headquarters um, with the hope of... Uh, General, generating a public debate in Israel, in the Israeli media, starting with the Israeli media with leading Israeli opinion shapers on <coughs> how, um, um, how to do this, given that CW, chemical weapons, isn't really an issue in um, Israeli society. It's not really, part it's a bit of a taboo, it's not really discussed. There are other issues, nuclear issues are often discussed, but... Um, other regional security issues, but not the issue of chemical weapons. It's, um, uh, all, all the journalists said, um, you know, it's just mind-boggling that they've been doing their jobs however long they've been doing them, and this issue sort of seems to have never come up in uh, security briefings or in any sort of, uh, any other sort of briefings. They simply have not written about them. But now I actually, and, and the main feedback that uh, they came back with is that they found it's very, very interesting to learn about the verification regime, to learn that the OPCW such, has such a detailed and, I think, excellent um, verification compliance uh, regime, and they thought that that would definitely be worthwhile um, investing in. So, I mean, we can debate with Shimon whether a regional, um, a regional parallel um, verification regime would be a good idea or not, but I actually think the OPCW themselves have quite a good um, system in place. And um, from that, I'd just like to move on to the issue of... Um, uh, Shimon mentioned very briefly a universalization, and Peter mentioned there were six countries that had not yet ratified um, the, um, the CWC out of 190 six countries that are eligible, 190 have ratified, and three, as we've heard, are on their way. That really leaves North Korea, Egypt, and Israel um, in place. Um, I, think it's, I think there's consensus that if Israel will ratify, uh, Egypt will, is likely to follow suit. Um, so in that, with that in mind, I won't focus too much on Egypt because I think it's more likely that Israel may ratify first. Um, it's not because I don't think, um, it's just the circumstances of sort of the transition that uh, Egypt is, 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 um, is in at present um, and they have other issues um, on the agenda, as does Israel. So as has briefly been mentioned, Israel has ceased to manufacture uh, gas masks in light of what is happening in Syria. In fact, um, on the 24th of December uh, 2014, the Defence Minister Bougie Alon has decided to completely halt the production of uh, gas masks even, and, and not even uh, manufacture anymore for soldiers, they, deeming that uh, there is no longer a threat from Syria or anywhere in the region, a chemical, I'm talking about a chemical <coughs> threat, to, Israeli, to the Israeli civilian population. There's some talk about a threat on the Syrian border um, from some residual capacity that has been left to soldiers and some soldiers will still have high quality masks but the general public will uh, not ha get any masks and the masks that they have will sort of simply uh, decay. I think that sends a very very strong message in terms of how the Israeli security apparatus uh, views um, the success of the OPCW 
work in Syria. It's not just that the OPCW got a Nobel Peace Prize. I think um, it's. Uh, I think at the time Israel was not at all convinced that the job was done. But I think um, Israel wouldn't take the risk of not producing gas masks had they thought that there was a, a significant risk. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to move. Um, I think that um, as Shimon went through the history, the history was yes, there, uh, there was deemed to be a threat, a region, a threat in the region, and that is uh, no longer the case. However, um, we are, there is concern that uh, chemical um, weapons will get into the hands of non-state actors, primarily ISIS and um, Hezbollah. From, you know, some, uh, there have been some reports that some chemical weapons have been left in Libya, um, and there's some uh, lack of clarity about the whereabouts. Um, I, uh, Peter mentioned that um, the OPCW is working on the Syrian declaration, um, whether the declaration is complete or not, it's already been amended ten times, which means that the original declaration was not incomplete, and the OPCW's fact-finding mission is still working um, on those issues. And, of course, in Israel there's much concern about um, the um, residual capacity that's left. But I do think an, a huge benefit for Israel being in the treaty, not outside the treaty, is being able to work with other countries other um, that are members... Uh, on how to prevent um, chemical weapons from getting into their common enemies, meaning the non-state actors. One of the problems with the OPCW regime, and it's, um, and it's this, this problem with all uh, international treaties, is that it doesn't cover non-state actors. They don't have the ability to, um, have to inspect non-state actors. Therefore, um, thank you. Therefore um, I think being in the treaty and working with other countries um, would send a very uh, strong message to uh, to those um, uh, those non-state actor groups. I think Israel not ratifying the country is sending a negative message to all of Israel's prospective enemies. It's like, well, why not? You know, why not ratify if you consider yourself a sovereign state? I've got two minutes, says the boss. So I would just like to also very briefly just point to the economic benefits, which are vast. Uh, if Israel were to join the treaty, Israel would uh, be able to trade both import and export <coughs> Schedule two chemicals. Schedule two chemicals at the CWC are all those chemicals that are used for dual use, meaning they have uh, usage potentially uh, for warfare, but they have huge um, civilian usages. Um, I don't have the time to go into it, but basically there's a huge economic cost to uh, not being uh, part of this. And Israel has just formally declared that it is in recession. Uh, and last but, uh, last, um, but not least, as Israel, um, whichever government comes to power on the 17th of March, um, they will want, not want to be the only country in the world uh, in the company of North Korea being outside such an important treaty. I think there's a moral obligation, uh, given the history in World War II, for Israel to join, as well as a legal one, um, and as well as a political and economic one. Thank you. Thank you, Nomi, and thanks for mentioning the uh, North Korea point. So um, <laughs> I know that Peter wanted to comment at one point there, but uh, shall we shall we take some comments from the floor sure, first? Sure. Uh, is that all right? Uh, Mark, can I say only uh, one point which Nomi raised with respect to uh, Egypt will follow if Israel will follow? Well, I happen to uh, be familiar with the Egyptian position. I think that uh, for Egypt... Uh, uh, the CWC, whether Israel ratifies or not, is of secondary importance. The primary cause uh, for the fact that Egypt has not is because Egypt conditions everything on Israel joining the NPT. I mean, that is what is uh, uppermost uh, on the Egyptian agenda, and whether, Nomi, if Israel uh, follows uh, and ratify, Egypt will follow. I have my own doubts. It's yeah. certainly not the case. Okay, let's, let, why don't we just, you come back to later if you don't mind, because I, I, there's about 10 people want to hear. Um, start off with uh, Edwina, then Paul, and then the gentleman right there in the back. Hi, Willie Morton, former journalist, uh, used to write on these issues, but hasn't done for a couple of years, so my question uh, may be out of date. But, um, Peter, in your remarks you very, uh, notwithstanding all the successes that you mentioned, you very carefully uh, talked about your successes in dealing with declared stockpiles. Um, when I was covering this subject, there were considerable suspicions about a number of countries having illicit stockpiles, and uh, the question is how to get at those in order to build confidence in the future success of the treaty. 
And uh, here the verification regime, which lots of people have mentioned, although on paper it's quite comprehensive, in practice, as far as I'm aware, has never been fully implemented. And it hasn't been for political reasons. And I wondered if you could comment on that and its impact on your future task of preventing the re-emergence of these weapons, because without the depth of the original verification regime, I don't really see how you can do that. If you're left with simply accounting for declared stockpiles, you'll get yourself into exactly the problem the NPT was in before the Iraq war established just how easy it was for governments to run rings around the organization that was meant to be upholding the treaty. Peter, would you mind if we took a couple sure. of, uh, so take a note of this important uh, uh, question. Paul Schulte. Uh, Paul Schulte, uh, King's Birmingham, and in this context relevant, former UNSCOM commissioner, um, because one's interested in similarities here, and I think the Iraqis got up to 14 full final and complete declarations. It's interesting that the Syrians have reached 10, is it, in <laughs> such a short time, and that there might be regime similarities and uh, overall structural uh, conditions which create the same kind of problem which Edwina mentioned. And this problem about the credibility and future utility and, and, and effectiveness of the treaty is wider than the perennially fascinating Israeli ratification debate. It's about how well this treaty will hold for this class of weapon and what it will indicate about our ability to control WMD in future by arms control rather than deterrence or, or containment. And could I ask then about how much we should be worried about things which weren't much referred to, the fact that the world still can't establish responsibility for the 1,500 dead, uh, Syrian casualties which triggered this whole thing. Now maybe that's uh, in diplomatic terms irrelevant because Syria wasn't in any treaty, so it doesn't matter. Uh, but on the other hand, it reminds us we're in the world where airliners can be shot down and nothing can be proved about who did it. So it says something about the way that great power relationships can frustrate evidence and, and attribution. Second point uh, is about stockpiles. And indications I get are, and, and this is a, a problem that the OPCW maybe will generate because everything's done behind closed doors, so one only does hear official indications, that there are significant unresolved disputes still going on between Western countries and the Syrians with the Russians playing their, their, their traditional shielding role for their, their clients. And that this looks like being a very long-term, neuralgic, um, perhaps credibility-gutting problem. And finally, the, the chlorine tax. Um, chemical warfare, OK, we, we understand it's not on any schedule, but this is a, a, a use of chemicals that nobody thought of when the, when the, the, the convention was drafted, wild, scruffy, false flag allegations, militarily trivial but psychologically important. And it looks as though the OPCW has very little ability. People can inspect, but it doesn't effectively investigate, come up with attributions or focus international action on continuing actual chemical warfare. <coughs> now, there seem to me three grave problems that you, uh, Peter, although I can accept that OPCW does a sterling job and all arms combine magnificently together in The Hague, doesn't seem very able to do it, but not much mention of them in, in your, I said, professionally upbeat introduction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I think given that there were three okay, questions there, and uh, and uh, the why is one, one. You maybe take those uh, now. I think yeah, sure, it's quite a lot. I'll just <clears throat> wait on a couple of this here. No, it's really absolutely right. We work on the basis of declarations by states parties. In relation to non-states parties, we have no views because we have no material to work with. Um, we don't have an intelligence <coughs> capacity. We have no mandate to have one. We have no expertise. We rely on states parties. Now, um, we rely in the CWC, um, and I think rightly, on states parties watching it. <coughs> Syria is a case in point. Syria has been under unprecedented international scrutiny. Now, the basis of our decision on a destruction program was the U.S.-Russia framework agreement on elimination of Syrian chemical weapons. The fact that both U.S. and Russia, with their information resources, were happy with the figure of 1,300 metric tons, or in fact that it might have exceeded the figure they had in their mind, is what has to inspire us with confidence. So, um, true, we work on the basis of declarations. By the same token, states parties watch each other and uh, raise issues of uh, potential non-compliance inside the OPCW when they think they can. Now, when they think they can is um, uh, problematic, um, perhaps by implication from what you were saying, 
We do have a challenge inspection uh, provision, and Paul is right that other public forum pointed out that, interestingly, from his time as a negotiator, that the, the expectation was that this would be a regime that would be used frequently to, keep, to hold people to account. In the 17 years that the CWC has been in force, it has never been used. Now, the pessimists um, uh, would suggest that, well, this shows that it's politically too tricky to invoke. Um, the optimists, or the more uh, a different point of view, might be that because of the level of scrutiny, um, it works as a deterrent. Um, we, you know, I can't put my hand in my heart and say the declaration is absolutely true, that there, are, that there are no illicit programs. I mean, that's not possible. I mean, it's very hard to deal with a dark cat in a black room, especially if you're blindfolded sometimes. But in relation to declarations, I mean, it's, it's, it's not just what states parties give us. It's what other states parties think is right in their assessment. And obviously some states parties have got more resources than others in that relation. Um, and having mentioned the challenge inspection regime, of course, before you get to a challenge inspection, there's a whole consultation process to bring people to account. Now, um, this has to be an important you know, informal factor in terms of how we prevent the re-emergence of chemical weapons. I mentioned before that it's you know, qualitatively a much harder task, especially as we have advances in science and technology that might challenge implementation of the convention in terms of the substances and production <coughs> technologies that we have to keep an eye out on. Um, but you know, this sort of work really relies on um, having an ongoing you know, proactive dialogue with a, you know, as broad a community of stakeholders as possible, scientific establishments, industry, and so forth. And this is our challenge coming up ahead. I mean, 20 years since we negotiated the CWC, my scientific advisor colleague tells me that 15,000 new ke potential chemical substances are added to the da um, chemical database on a daily basis, up to 2 million gene sequences. Um, you can't control this like we might have envisaged controlling in the past. What we need now is a more proactive approach to uh, how we monitor and these sorts of developments. Um, in relation to Paul's questions, you know, certainly um, arms control or deterrence, I mean, the bottom line, I think, is that no country can claim even an implied strategic advantage by being a chemical weapon possessor state. I mean, this is a point that Angela Cain made at our um, the EU, um, EU Non-Proliferation Forum in September. It's not a, a, a you know something that you can use to enhance your status or power. Um, and we've seen the reaction to use of chemical weapons um, in in the Syrian context. I mean, quite. I mean, in almost three years of conflict at that point, the only point that the international community could agree on in relation to Syria, despite the extraordinary humanitarian crisis there, was chemical demilitarization. Um, and that just goes to show the strength of global consensus in this, in, in this, uh, um, uh, in this uh, context. Um, on accountability, well, I mean, the OPCW doesn't have any mandate or prerogatives here. The UN Security Council Resolution 2118 does cover accountability. Um, and this is really a political issue. It's up to states, parties, members of the Security Council to do something with the evidence that's being compiled. I mean, whether it applies in the CW context, it applies to the humanitarian war crimes context as well. I mean, a lot of NGOs are working with the local Syrian communities to record evidence for future use. But these things um, you know, often take time and obviously political will, but that's really not something that the OPCW deals with, so I won't comment more on that. Um, of course, I mean, uh, the potential for politicization in any uh, multilateral effort is, is immense. Um, what I highlighted in my presentation was there was an opportunity in relation to Syria and we seized it and we got rid of the kit quickly and efficiently. Now if there's any residual concerns we need to address them. Um, when I mentioned that the strategic threats have been removed, I think one can safely say that because you know, a handful of chemical weapons is not a game changer between states um, like a nuclear weapon might be. So I think uh, um, the overall record is pretty good there. Um, once again, this is a question of political will um, uh, between member states, uh, as it is in the accountability context. Chlorine was, in fact, thought about, I mean, the CWC. There is a general purpose criterion in the CWC which states that any chemical used as a weapon in warfare situation is a chemical weapon um, in the definition required. Now, it's not obviously something that's controlled. Thank God there's chlorine in the Middle East. Otherwise, we'd have, you know, all score of waterborne diseases and so on. I mean, so, you know, this is a very good example of the dual-use dilemma in relation to the sort of uh, materials we're dealing with. Um, so if it's used as a chemical weapon by a state, they are in non-compliance with the Chemical Weapons Convention and will be dealt with. I mean, and there's a whole procedure for doing that, going right through to referral to the Security Council. 
non-state actors using chlorine obviously is problematic for the reasons that Nomi mentioned. I mean, uh, not only uh, do our global non-proliferation norms um, design without state, non-state actors in mind, um, they're not subject to the same you know, disincentives that states are or pressures. So that's obviously a, a problem that we need to deal with. Um, I think I've covered most of the questions there. Yes, I think you did. Let's uh, go back then. We'll take three. First of all, the gentleman far in the back, then you, and then Norm Dumby. Um, uh, Jürgen Kassel from the Guardian. So, uh, short question. Um, Non-state actors. Um, Islamic State, I saw uh, said several times now that uh, they seized the chemical weapons from the Syrian forces. Uh, is this feasible or is it total nonsense? <coughs> Is it feasible that oh, they could steal chemical weapons? Is it feasible okay. or is it nonsense? Yeah. Okay. They, they, they said that they have them in their possession. Okay. You, sir? Um, I'm you about Hayat <coughs> you, you spoke about, uh, uh, you know, we spoke about undeclared chemical weapons in Syria. Have you had any inspections to any sites that you suspected that the Syrians have been hiding chemical weapons in, in, in them during the past maybe year? And, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. Okay, Norm Dambi. Um, a couple of points. One on the generalization of the CWC. The CWC has been very successful, but it doesn't cover radiological weapons, as I understand it. For example, polonium 210. Um, it doesn't cover, non, as you pointed out, non state actors. Uh, and in particular, you concentrate <coughs> on state actors in the Middle East. But there's a whole group of non state actors, which are client states of Russia, um, Donetsk, Luhansk, Abkhazia, Ossetia, and so on, um, which presumably could, in principle, do things outside the Chemical Weapon Convention with Russia's consent. And the second point is based on nuclear analysis, which I know more about than I do chemical. Um, one is that there is a good regional um, agreement in Europe, which has been there for almost 50 years, which may be a model for the Middle East, and that is the Euratom, which, tells, which is in force in parallel with a non-proliferation treaty, and for which inspectors um, inspect nuclear installations as they do in the IAEA. And sorry, I'll <laughs> and the fourth point is, is, for, is that Israel um, isn't the main reason that Israel is, um, doesn't especially want to sign the CWC, is the pressure that will grow on it to do something about nuclear Okay, so a couple of factual questions there. Um, I think the last question would be to Shimon. Uh, Peter, you want to take the, the first couple of questions? Um, yes, yeah, about the feasibility of non-state actors stealing chemical weapons from Syria. Well, chemical weapons have been removed from Syria. All declared chemical weapons that Syria um, presented to us have been removed from that country and accounted for and verified at every, pro every stage. The transportation, the um, offloading on the ships, the destruction processes, the destruction processes of land-based facilities. So um, whether there was any potential to steal chemical weapons before that happened, I mean, that's not a question I can respond to. I mean, uh, um, uh, undeclared weapons, well, I mean, we work on the base of declaration. So if there are any undeclared hidden weapons in any country, we won't know about it unless another state party raises a con compliance concern about that country, and then we address it in the context of the consultation process and the challenge inspection regime we have. We have. Uh, um, but you haven't, you haven't made any inspections, undeclared inspections this year. We only go to declared facilities and sites. Yeah. And you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. Um, what else do we have? Polonium. Well, polonium is not a you know. A toxic chemicals, so I mean it doesn't really fall in our purview. Um, non-state actors aren't of course covered for the reasons we mentioned. I mean the, the regime was negotiated with non-state actors in mind and as I mentioned before there are different, there's a different dissuading them. Um, 
Well, territories where, well, I mean, uh, that you mentioned before, well, Russia obviously is a state party to the Chemical Weapons Convention. Some of the territories you referred to are not part of Russia as such, whatever the, the actual on-the-ground situation is and the politics involved, which I, I won't <coughs> comment on. Um, Euratom is a model, if I understood you correctly, for cooperation on, on nuclear issues. I mean, likewise, one of the four pillars of the Chemical Weapons Convention is to promote international cooperation in chemistry. Um, and uh, we have very extensive programs and a whole division in the OPCW devoted to this, which is, of course, of great economic benefit, to, especially to countries with economies in transition. Um, and, uh, well, the slippery slope argument I'll leave to Shimon, yes. perhaps comment afterwards. Let me uh, not be uh, politically correct uh, in making <coughs> one comment uh, following uh, uh, Peter. When I uh, earlier uh, outlined the uh, three or avenues for Israel to react post-Syria, and I said that I will privately advocate Israel ratifying under that circumstances, <coughs> I have no illusion uh, that uh, we might face uh, in the future, the not too distant or in the distant future, problems with compliance and uh, misuse of uh, challenge inspections. Then at the end of the day, uh, given what I uh, call the culture of deceit in the region, and we have ample uh, examples for the culture of deceit for countries in the region that have ratified, signed and joined the uh, NPT, or for that matter uh, CWC, Syria has many years claimed that they have no weapons and ultimately it came out by, ac by accident, by the way. So there's something in the culture of deceit in the region which doesn't make one uh, hopeful uh, that uh, we may not see in the uh, future a country which uh, all of a sudden, i.e. Iran, Natanz and Fordo, all of a sudden we discovered that they have an undeclared uh, site that they are producing whatever they produce. And even that is not enough, Syria is under tremendous pressure only to, uh, in the last week, uh, <coughs> to see uh, news that resurfaced about Syria engaged again in trying to build uh, nuclear weapons or material for that with the assistance of North Korea. So I think that there is a big question mark with respect to compliance uh, in the region and the problems of the verification are all known and one of the gentlemen has pointed out how effective the uh, NPT and the IAEA were in, uh, in detecting. As to the slippery slope, uh, that is certainly one of the arguments that those who will say hold your horses will advocate. We start with the CWC and then pressure will mount on Israel also to take the next step and join the NPT. So uh, obviously in the political echelons uh, there are many doubts, even if I will uh, join uh, Nomi in saying that there are some differences that I have detected between the uh, military establishment and the uh, threat assessment of uh, that establishment, objectively speaking, and the political echelons who uh, have their own opinion Israel, generally speaking, and the whole complex of arms control and disarmament has been rather passive and reactive and not proactive. There was only one uh, uh, time in uh, the recent history during the 90s where we were in the mode of uh, doing peace and hoping that uh, peace is around the corner, that Israel has, uh, in a revolutionary way, changed its attitude towards arms, arms control and disarmament, it was also that period where we joined the CWC uh, and the CTBT and where we were playing an active role in the OPCW in crafting the inspection regime, uh, which we are still actively involved, I guess, in the fact that uh, we are observer. And You're a signatory, uh, not a... You see, we are signature, yes, uh, sorry. You have negotiated the treaty, but otherwise there hasn't been any... But we have been in the uh, years leading to the uh, full implementation, very active in that period of uh, dealing with the convention and making our points. I remember because I was head of the department at the time and I knew how active we were. Mm -hmm. So altogether, yes, the slippery slope uh, is a subject that comes twice often up in saying, uh, well, uh, don't do it because that might happen, to, uh, uh, that might expect us around the corner. Yeah. Um. With the um, permission of the panelists, I'd like to uh, extend this uh, for 15 minutes. But since we advertised that it was from 11 to 12, 
some of you have appointments to get to or lunch uh, engagements. You won't uh, be uh, taken uh, remiss if you get up and leave right now. It's 12 o'clock. Um, I'm going to, uh, we're going to come back to the panelists for some final comments um, toward the end of this 15 minute period. I think there are several people who want to raise uh, points. If you could raise them uh, quickly. Before I call on a couple people here in the front, is there anybody from Egypt who um, would like to take the floor? I don't want to <laughs> make, okay, I don't see any. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, hello. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, my question is the following. Given, uh, Alberto, uh, King's College from uh, student. Uh, given that we are approaching a moment where due to uh, the globalization of the chemical industry and uh, certain technology and breakthroughs like micro reactors, we might be seeing out of dual use facilities that quickly can be reconfigured to produce chemical weapons uh, and that would amount to have many virtual or latent arsenals. How should the if it should be um, rethink the inspection mechanism, the challenge inspection mechanism. Okay. Um, Jonathan, did you, and then Chris, did you have? No, no. Jonathan, go ahead. Yeah, a quick question. Uh, Nomi mentioned uh, non state actors <coughs> with chemical weapons. Um, Hezbollah has declared, Nasrallah has declared he's not interested in chemical weapons. But it seems to me that the Israeli security government is increasingly focused, unlike in 1993, when you were very active on this, uh, less on states and more on non-state actors. Ami um, Dvor said uh, the other day that Hezbollah has 150,000 projectiles, more than uh, all of Europe combined. Now, he may be exaggerating, but I think the point is that Hezbollah is becoming increasingly seen as a strategic threat. And to what extent... Uh, Shimon, do you see Hezbollah as like a state and therefore it should be treated like a state with respect to chemical weapons and, and, and a variety of other things? Okay, and then the th uh, gentleman in the third row here? Yes, you. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So, um, two questions basically. The first one, uh, from name first. Mahmoud Alkan from Al Jazeera. Um, you mentioned. Yeah, that's it. Um, you mentioned that element, um, that limit in the chemical Syria weapon, uh, chemical uh, weapons in Syria, uh, eliminated <coughs> the last strategic threat in the region. Am I correct about that? Um, and what, how would such a statement be uh, being made <coughs> if other countries in the region, such as Israel and Egypt, would not ratify uh, the treaty? And the, the second question actually is a follow-up from uh, one of our um, audience here, which I was asked by, um, you know, the average people in Syria, that, you know, there is a rumor that says there is still arsenal that was not declared to this uh, OPCW. Um, uh, I know that you answered that saying that we cannot um, follow up on uh, the chemical weapons that was not declared, but also the OPCW has some intelligence information about that. Is it still at the level of you know, rumors that undeclared um, uh, chemical weapons arsenal, or there is some uh, confident or con uh, s a certain level of confidence um, that uh, intelligence information do, does state that um, uh, chemical weapons arsenal is still uh, available or um, is still in, in Syria. In Syria in regime. Yes. If I could ask a follow-up question, and thank you for clarifying that um, he was asking about Syria. The issue of um, undeclared chemical weapons arsenal uh, in other countries has come up in news. In December, there were press reports um, uh, actually attributed um, to somebody in The Hague uh, about Israel possessing chemical weapons and Egypt possessing chemical weapons. Um, I wonder if uh, if anybody could could shed some light on those press reports. Uh, Peter, why don't you? Yeah, I sure. guess you probably most of these questions are um, to you. But an interesting question. I mean, you know, on inspections in a virtual space. I mean, given that I have a PhD in Russian literature rather than chemistry or or you know IT modeling, I mean, I'm not really qualified to answer that. I mean, how you address it. Of course, um, I did mention you know intangible technology transfer as being an issue of, of potential concern. Um, I say that informed by previous jobs I've done in our foreign ministry in relation to export control, how extensive do you make it? And obviously, this is a very difficult area to cover. Um, you know, our inspections are effectively based on transfers of materials in terms of states, parties to the convention having to <laughs> declare transfers of scheduled chemicals um, and obviously um, making sure that chemical production is 
exclusive for peaceful uses, and we do that through our routine um, industry inspection regime. We also have a scientific advisory board that you know, we um, the reports directly to the D Director General independently, um, with independently sourced advice. Um, on things we should be looking out for and perhaps raising in the context um, of our executive council meetings with states parties to see whether it's worthwhile focusing on it. But we rely on that sort of a mechanism to look at what's coming up ahead. Um, in relation to um, what I said, and you quoted me quite correctly, the last strategic threat, perhaps what I meant to say was the last known strategic threat because, as I mentioned in my comments, the OPCW can only deal with um, declarations by states parties. Um, and uh, um, given that you know, Egypt and Israel are the only countries in the region, I mean, I have to say no threat because, of course, we don't know what Israel and Egypt, what their status is because they're not states' parties to the Chemical Weapons Convention. Um, so basically the last known strategic it's threat... In chemical weapons. Chemical threat. weapons, yes. Mm -hmm. Because we're based on declarations, yes. So um, in, in relation to possible undeclared arsenals, well, I mean, um, as I mentioned, we deal with declarations. So if you know, our states parties have concerns, and of course we have confidentiality provisions in terms of the information we share among states parties, so I'll be careful in what I say here, but if a state party has concerns about the comprehensiveness of a declaration by another state party, based on information it has available, it can choose to raise that. Um, inside the OPCW, whether with a technical secretariat or with states parties in one of our executive council meetings, or in uh, smaller member state consultations to try and clear these matters up. Um, but um, uh, you know, so so and you know, if if there is um, if that process is not satisfactory and there's a call to follow up, we will, uh, as a matter of course, of course. I mean, uh, given the various uh, provisions we have, including you know challenge inspections. Is that covered? You want to say anything about the press allegations about Israel and Egypt? No, I don't know. Okay. Shimon, you had a specific question, and if you are able to address my question. I also don't know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <coughs> your guess is good as mine, Mark. Uh, Jonathan, well, I don't want to uh, comment, uh, interpret uh, our previous uh, or former National Security Advisor, Jacob Amidro, who is entitled to his own opinion which most of the time I disagree with, uh, but that is not uh, what I am about to say. I think that <coughs> whether Hezbollah has or doesn't have, one thing is clear to me, that if Hezbollah will attack Israel using chemical weapons, Israel will not respond in the same way, but the Israel response will be a massive retaliation. I think that Hezbollah will have to think twice whether to resort to uh, non-conventional weapons uh, when contemplating another attack on Israel. But the response will be uh, massive. I mean, that is quite clear. The nature of which uh, uh, we should uh, leave to your own imagination. Uh, I privately, as I said, believe that uh, Israel uh, uh, should... Uh, I should join uh, under that circumstances. The reason is certainly that I said the, uh, I see no uh, point, uh, if even if we have in uh, in uh, maintaining them. As to the nature of Hezbollah, Hezbollah is, as you know, is uh, a hybrid organization. It is an organization, but it is organization which runs a state. So I think that uh, following the last. Uh, war in Lebanon, Israel has left uh, the uh, strategy which says we retaliate only the Dahiya uh, doctrine, which says Israel retaliate only against the organization. I think following that, uh, now that uh, Hezbollah is part of the Lebanese government, uh, uh, it carries responsibility for the entire land of Lebanon, and therefore Israel will hold the Hezbollah is responsible for uh, Lebanon and as such our response will not be only confined to hitting targets of the organization but other major strategic infrastructure were that to be the case if we were attacked again by Lebanon. So there has been a change in Israel overall approach to uh, the notion of uh, 
what kind of response to a threat that uh, uh, we uh, uh, get from uh, Hezbollah. Thank you, Shimon. Um, no, ma'am, I'm going to put you on the spot. I know you don't speak for uh, Israel. Obviously, you don't speak for OPCW, <coughs> but what do you think about these press reports that... Uh, that it was claimed that uh, both of the states in the region who are not parties to the CWC have currently chemical weapons stockpiles? Well, I think, as you said, they're press reports, and uh, I think the only way to move forward really is to ratify the treaty. I think if the treaty um, is ratified by Israel and Egypt, uh, neither Egypt and, and Israel and Egypt take care of what they may or may not have ahead of time, uh, those um, air, um, the, the OPCW won't inspect those um, um, areas. Once you, as far as I understand, um, once uh, the ratification process goes into place, um, countries that are in the process of ratification have time to deal with uh, whatever stockpiles they may or may not have. And therefore, um, as, we dis as I said earlier, there is no reason whatsoever for any country in the region uh, to possess chemical weapons. They can't be used, and um, there is a risk that they will get into the wrong hand. Um, and given that there is absolutely uh, no reason to possess them, if indeed any country does, um, it shouldn't be an obstacle to ratification. Okay, Mark, actually, yeah. I can comment. I'm sorry, I misunderstood where the comment was coming from. Um, the... As I mentioned, I mean, we, the OPCW, cannot have a view on what non-states parties have or do not have until they've submitted a declaration. Um, if there's been any uh, media speculation, um, it's uh, um, you know, unauthorized, obviously, and, and in incorrect. Um, in fact, uh, the briefing that um, Nomi referred to that we had in the, in the Hague with some senior Israeli journalists, um, there was a on our website. There's a there's a, an, a clarification note there in relation to how the OPCW regards non-states parties. Okay, thank you. Um, we have time for one last question. If anybody has an urgent question they need to pose, Olivia, please. Olivia used to be with the 1540 Committee. 1540 committee. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit, um, I don't have the details in another office that deals with this, but we do have a cooperation. In fact, I think from memory, we require our states' parties to um, alert us to their 1540 reports as a way of promoting um, regular reporting under that mechanism. Um, and we do, we did have a, um, I know there are consultations with the 1540 Committee that we have uh, on a regular basis dealt with our Office of Strategy and Policy, but I, I'm afraid I can't really give you much more detail. But I'm happy to do that separately by email if you like. Um, thank you. Thank you, Peter. I think we're going to wrap things up. I'll, I'll ask the, uh, the panelists if they want to uh, make any final uh, comment. I think I just have to say one thing. Shimon, I, when, when you laid out your three approaches and you said yours would be three, but then you said... But, you know, that, that approach probably, you know, be something that the time is not yet ripe for. Then basically it's, it's number one. It's continuation of the status quo. Not necessarily, Isn't but uh, that's another, for another panel if you invite me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. okay, any final comments, uh, Shimon, otherwise? Yeah, I would uh, only, uh, following your uh, remark, will say changes usually should... Uh, uh, lead us to uh, revise, revisit our all assumptions. I think that the Syrian move belonged to those changes that ought to uh, uh, be uh, taken in Israel, not uh, as uh, a kind of, well, another event, and until uh, peace doesn't prevail, Israel will halt its horses. I think that that can be an opportunity. My approach was based on the notion that we should take that opportunity and see what can be made out of uh, that for the entire region. But I also said, uh, Mark, that I can sympathize with the notion that with the Syrian move, uh, Israel has been relieved of a major strategic threat. Syria, uh, Egypt doesn't present another uh, additional threat, so therefore uh, Israel should, uh, in light of that, uh, reconsider its position. Whether Israel will do it or not, uh, I have my own doubts, but uh, that is uh, what I would see, an opportunity uh, for uh, revisiting certain assumptions. 
Good. That's a nice place to end. Revisit assumptions. Yeah. Mm. Uh, no, I mean, why don't you... S- no, I was just thinking exactly with the... Uh, I was usually asking for sort of 30 seconds of final comments. I just... Uh, um, with revisiting sort of uh, old assumptions, I just think, I just like, that um, we're coming towards, you know, a huge anniversary, 100th anniversary of the first use of mass chemical weapons in April, um, <coughs> in IPRA, in... Um, where chemical weapons were used against Middle Eastern um, uh, troops, divisions, and I just and I fighting alongside the French, and I think it's a grand a moment and opportunity for everyone to revisit their positions and to try to achieve universalization of um, the CWC. Thank you, Peter. Any final word? No, I just you know express appreciation for Shimon's very interesting um, three points that you mentioned before, and uh, maybe I, I you saw a bit of a sliding rule there in terms of Shimon's own views, but. I really appreciate the sort of devil's advocate um, account of the status quo position. I mean, but for me, I mean, uh, I just can't get logic quite right. I mean, it's because countries in your region had security concerns in relation to chemical weapons arsenals that they, in fact, joined the Chemical Weapons Convention. I think Jordan, in particular, was very assiduous in finding out what it's entitled to under the Chemical Weapons Convention. If you perceive a threat, whether by a state or a non-state actor, it's best to be inside the Chemical Weapons Convention um, in order to address that, um, especially in relation to a situation where there might not be any more state programs, but there's a threat from non-state actors. Why? Because in terms of assistance and protection, you're entitled to a lot of rights in, um, under the Chemical Weapons Convention than you what would not otherwise be entitled to. Um, and that's a, that's a very important point, I think. Um, so there's really no advantage to being outside the Chemical Weapons Convention if being outside is based on security concerns. Quite the contrary. Um, Likewise, I mean, uh, I personally would like to see Israel and Egypt inside the convention, given your experience with non-state actors, to better inform how we could pinpoint our efforts to address you know, what is an assiduous problem, and obviously a very topical one. The slippery slope argument in relation to a perceived trajectory of, you know, if you sign this treaty, you'll be more pressure on that. I mean, the bottom line is that um, you know, I'm not an NPT specialist, and certainly, you know, but the Israeli position is quite familiar that it's probably way down the track before Israel might consider exceeding the NPT. But the bottom line is that Israel already gets a lot of pressure on the, the, um, on the NPT. And in fact, the Egyptian position, we haven't got a spokesman for it, but I think somebody suggested it was um, sign- signing on to the CWC was contingent on Israel joining the NPT. I think, Shimon, you mentioned that. You know, if that is the case, I mean, uh, there's a real political gain to undercutting Egypt by actually exceeding the CWC and exposing um, you know, shortcomings perhaps on their side, especially given the international taboo against chemical weapons. So um, that hasn't really been a persuasive argument for me. Um, I'd just like to finish on the regional verification regime idea, which I think, Shimon, we discussed at a previous event here. Um, you know, there's nothing to prevent Israel from uh, and, and regional countries from doing this. I mean, the bottom line is that if Israel were to exceed, um, you know, the only country outside of the CWC would be Egypt. So you already have a quorum of countries to do something on a regional basis. Now, this doesn't happen under OPCW auspices. If a bunch of countries want to do something at a regional level, we strongly encourage them to do that. And if you want to have a verification regime plus under mutual uh, um, consent, we would laud that. Um, but I think you know, tying that to a broader discussion on WMD is a kiss of death. I mean, uh, we've really seen the WMD conference process hasn't rendered any results so far. But you know, our strong view is the CWC already stands on its own merits. But more importantly, because it's already a complete verification regime, in relation to a commodity that's taboo and nobody will you know, use as a strategic option, why not accede to it? Why not um, uh, practice the verification regime, which is not going to be at the expense of any strategic option? And use that as a confidence building measure for what might happen down the track in relation to a WMD regional um, regime um, that's been agreed by parties in the region and is addresses you know, historic compliance problems and issues. Um, so I think I might leave that there. Thank okay, you. let's uh, let's stay there. Thank you much, uh, very much for, for your patience uh, and your good uh, comments. Thank you for the three panelists. Please join me in, uh, in thanking them.